Hi, this is Eric Montgomery, the 6th Naval Beach Battalion, and welcome to D-Day Conyans 2020 virtual program. So glad you can join us uh, here today, and unfortunately because of COVID-19, we can't be on the shores of Lake Erie doing what we love to do, is reenact our greatest generation. On the morning of June 6th, one of those men of the greatest generation was my great uncle, Amon Isber. In this video, Almond can be seen as the fourth man down the port side ramp of this landing craft. It was 7.35 a.m. on D-Day. As part of the 6th Naval Beach Battalion, he was assigned to lead the hydrographic section of Company C-8, tasked to establish the safe sea lanes for approaching and departing landing craft. Other sailors of the 6th were assigned to repair boats and get them seaworthy again while other men were part of the communication section that needed to establish shore-to-ship communications, while others assigned to treat those who were wounded in action and make provisions to evacuate those men back to England. All of these actions were to be performed under enemy fire, and none more so than what happened on June 6, 1944, a day that will live on in World War II lore as the longest day. At 36 years of age, Almond was one of the oldest men on the beach. He was under the command of Ensign Joseph Foggy, a then 23-year-old college football star who was now a Navy beach master in what he described as being a traffic cop in hell. In 2008, after being a part of the D-Day reenactment in Conneaut for several years, I formed the 6th Naval Beach Battalion Reenacted in tribute to Almond. Since then, 25 men and one woman have joined with me to honor this little-known group of sailors, sailors dressed as soldiers, the men of the United States Navy Beach Battalions. And of course, when you come to D-Day Conneaut, you're going to see a lot of different troops, and they have different helmets to kind of designate what they are and what, uh, what divisions they represent, and of course, what their roles are. And the best person to describe that is uh, Chief Warrant Officer Tim Green, out of Macedon, New York. Tim, thank you so much. All right, thank you for joining me. In this segment, we're gonna talk about the US M1 steel helmet. The M1 steel helmet was adopted in 1941 and was sought as a replacement for the World War I vintage M1917 as we see illustrated here. As we can also see that the 1917 afforded very little protection to the individual wearer and by the 1940s it was deemed necessary to replace the 1917. So the 1917 is out. In 1941, the M1 was adopted. As we see here, it afforded much greater protection to the individual wearer due to its deep bowl shape. It was of a two-piece construction. It had an outer steel shell made of manganese steel and also had an inner liner constructed of fiber resin and also supported had the supporting uh, suspension system which was fully adjustable to the individual wearer. The M1 helmet, as we've mentioned, was adopted in 1941 and saw service with the U.S. military well up into the 1980s, making it having over 40 years of active service with the U.S. military. Now, what we want to talk about now is markings that could be found on helmets on D-Day. Now, from recent films such as Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers and other films of that nature, we know that Army helmets were very well marked uh, as worn by units on D-Day. In most cases, we can find some sort of divisional marking such as we see here on this first division helmet. Um, and a number of variety of other markings can be found on the helmet such as among the airborne specifically, uh, regimental and battalion markings. Other markings that were commonly seen are on the backs of helmets were a white vertical stripe which indicated a commissioned officer and a horizontal stripe um, which indicated a non-commissioned officer. Other helmets that we would run across um, pretty much generally were corpsmen's helmets or medic's helmets which usually had a white circle or square located around the helmet with red crosses indicating their assignment for medical duties. Now, one Army helmet that we don't commonly see, but was there nonetheless, were those of the Special Engineering Brigades. These were combat engineers on the beach with their supporting units performing in their various roles and functions. Their helmets are commonly marked with a white arc on the front of the helmet, and in some cases we find hand rendering or stencil designs of the uh, engineering patch as we see illustrated here. Again, not commonly seen, but they were out there and on the beach. 
Now the U.S. Navy realized that it was going to have hundreds if not thousands of sailors on the beach during D-Day in the various uh, roles that they would take up in, during the landings. Okay, it became apparent that they would also have to be able to identify their sailors readily. Most sailors were generally still wearing their dungaree or foul weather equipment uh, as issued by the Navy, but a large number of them were also wearing herringbone twill styled uniforms of the Army and coveralls. So the need to identify them became very apparent. So the Navy put out an order for all sailors to paint uh, a gray band, a two inch gray band around the helmet and usually stenciled the letter USN on the front, commonly found in white or gray paint. Uh, these helmets are often seen with the various uh, landing boat crews. They are also found among the Seabees and any other naval personnel that found himself on the beach on D-Day uh, had their helmets painted in, in this design. Now working with the Special Engineering Brigades were the three Navy Beach Battalions. These were sailors assigned to the beaches to facilitate the landings and they were found the second on Utah Beach and the sixth and the seventh on Omaha Beach. Now, from what we see from original examples and photographs, the second pretty much followed the standard Navy practice of a gray band and just simply the USN painted on the uh, front of the helmet. And not a whole lot of variation or difference in that respect uh, in terms of the helmet. So they're pretty simple, and very basic. Now, the other thing we must realize, too, is these helmets were not painted by a big organization anywhere. These were painted by the individuals. In some cases, uh, sailors that had some sort of artistic talent uh, were assigned the role of painting the helmet. So there's going to be a lot of individuality in that no two helmets are really exactly alike. So the second Beach Smashers on uh, Utah Beach pretty much followed the standard Navy pattern. Now over on Omaha Beach we find the six Beach Masters. Now the six Beach Masters helmet is commonly found with the gray band painted around it and it's just a simple red arc on the front of the helmet. Uh, very few ever are found with the USN painted on them, uh, but simply just the uh, gray band and a red arc. Some are found also with the stenciling of USN in black on the back. In a lot of cases as well, hand rendering or stenciling of the individual's name was also found on the back. So that would be the six Beach Masters. Now this example, as we see here, is of the seventh Beach Masters, and it was probably the most detailed of all the helmets on D-Day. It sported the gray band. In a lot of cases, too, the gray band, even among the six, was extended all the way down the helmet body onto the, the rim of the helmet. So this was commonly seen as well. The seventh Beach Masters painted the red arc uh, as previous, and also the letters USN, and they had also included their battalion marking on the front, the number seven. The number seven often predates uh, the gray band order. In a lot of cases, when the bands were painted on, the number seven is partially obscured, if not completely covered. So this was a helmet, as we can see here, commonly found on D-Day as worn by the seventh Beach Masters. Now, for those of you, I hope you get a chance to visit Conneaut. Uh, if you do, you'll be able to see the various helmets worn by the various army units uh, on the beach uh, during that time frame. Also take note to look at the landing craft crews. So most of them will be sporting the gray banded USN helmets uh, as we discussed here uh, this morning. And also you'll see the Navy Beachmaster. Sailors dressed like soldiers but sporting the Beachmaster styled helmets, gray band, red arcs, and so forth. And we know that these are sailors on D-Day. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it was informative. And I hope you get a chance to visit Conneaut and come out and see us. And also please continue watching our series. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. I appreciate all that information and I hope we learned a little bit about what you could see at D-Day Kania. And to tell us a little bit more about the communication section of the Beach Battalions is Chris Egan of Elmira, New York. Chris? Today in this presentation, we will discuss the methods of communication used by the Naval Beach Battalions. There were two basic categories, radio and visual. Radios were limited by supply need for large and heavy batteries or a generator and limited available frequencies. Visual communications were ideal for shorter ranges. The Naval Beach Battalions needed to communicate with command ships, landing craft, and adjacent beach sections. Each beach battalion was divided into companies and further divided into platoons. Each of the officers were called beach masters and they often needed to communicate with the adjacent stations. This role fell on the Navy signalmen. Visual communications 
or that sailor's technical skill. They went to school to learn how to send and receive visual messages using flag hoist, semaphore, blinker light, and signal flares. Each of these was like learning a new language and required plenty of practice to perform in combat or foul weather. Each method had advantages and limitations, and these need to be understood as well. A non-rated sailor striking as a signalman would complete various steps and evaluations to eventually be a rated signalman. These would be signalman third class, signalman second class, signalman first class, and chief signalman. During school, there were several training aids and exercises. The basics of signaling were included in the 1943 Blue Jackets manual, marked by the black pages on the end. Have you ever noticed when speaking to people that certain letters can get confusing, such as C, D, E, and P? To prevent this confusion when the stakes are high, a phonetic alphabet is used. This assigns a word to each letter. During the Second World War, the phonetic alphabet was as follows. Abel, Baker, Charlie, Dog, Easy, Fox, George, How, Item, Jig, King, Love, Mike, Nan, Oboe, Peter, Queen, Roger, Sugar, Tear, Uncle, Victor, William, X-Ray, Yoke, and Zebra. These words are also assigned to the flags in the flag hoist system to prevent their confusion as well. During Operation Neptune, the amphibious portion of Operation Overlord, the beaches of Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword were further divided into sectors. Each sector used a letter of the phonetic alphabet, such as on Utah Beach under the 2nd Naval Beach Battalion of Sugar, Tear, Uncle, Victor, and Omaha, which was covered by the 7th and 6th Naval Beach Battalions, Charlie, Doug, Easy, and Fox. These beaches in some cases were further divided into colored sectors as well, such as Easy Red and Easy Green, or Dog Red, Dog White, and Dog Green. Flag hoist is one of the most recognized forms of visual communication used by the Navy signalman. It is an international system of multicolored flags and pennants with assigned meanings or directions. Some stand for numbers and letters. It is the most complex form of signaling covered in the Blue Jackets manual. It has two major limitations. It is daytime only and it requires equipment not available to the beach battalions. While the beach battalions didn't use it for outgoing messages, the signalman needed to know what ships off of the beach were signaling to them or to each other. Vessels as small as the LCT and LCI, right up to vessels as large as battleships, were equipped to communicate this way. The major points I want to discuss are some letter flags, spelling piano, were called their function, not their phonetic alphabet identifier. They are affirmative, interrogatory, negative, option, and preparatory. Flags do not spell out words, except in the rare case of a name needing to be spelled. There's a limited supply of flags on each ship. Depending on the size of the vessel, the flag bag, which was the rack they were stored in, maybe only held one or two of each, and then a repeater was used to signify a flag that was already up on the halyard, which is the rope that's used to raise them. Combinations of letters and numbers and special pennants conveyed messages listed in the International Maritime Code Books. The U.S. Navy would also have its own code book with secret operational messages and additional messages only pertinent to naval service. It is also worth noting that each ship has a four-letter call used to identify itself and that raising or lowering it has specific meanings. Some of them can be used in coordination with semaphore. Shown here in the Blue Jacket manual are the letter flags and the numeral flags. Also shown in the Blue Jackets manual are some of the special purpose flags and the pennants. Arguably one of the most useful signaling tools of the Navy signalman is the blinker light. These came in many different sizes and styles, some of them of the shipboard size that were brought ashore and needed power generators, as shown in other parts of this video, or the self-contained signal light with battery pack included. This was a particularly useful item because it could be set down, signaled remotely, in, in a hostile area battalion. They could bring them ashore immediately during the invasion. They can signal back out to the ships because it was bright enough. They could signal down the beach to other beach battalion platoons. During the invasion, these lights could be set 
on the side of a crater and the signalman can take cover inside of a bomb crater or behind a dune for maximum cover while the message is being sent. Otherwise, after the area was secured, they can be set up permanently. Blinker lights used Morse code. While typically the domain of the radio men, a visual form of this light using dots dashes signaled at roughly 16 words per minute was used. If you did need to slow down, it was ideal to not slow down the letters themselves, but put more space between each letter or the words themselves. This is because signalmen were taught to recognize the string of dots and dashes that made up the letter. Dots and dashes. Standard Morse code was published in the Blue Jackets manual for use while signaling via blinker light. As you can see, letters varied in length from one dot or dash to up to four dots or dashes in various combinations. This uh, could be used either directly from the battery pack and aim through the sight and engage, or through some rewiring. It could be mounted here. A remote trigger can be connected to the battery, and then one could stand off and signal. Right now, uh, we're going to demonstrate some things about this. So as mentioned, you only want your intended receiver to get the message. So if you sighted through it, when the light is on, only the intended receiver should be able to see it. If someone is standing off to the side, or a ship is out of alignment from the light, the light won't be seen. This also protects the signalman from possibly being spotted by enemy combatants. The light is adjusted with a rheostat on the back for varying brightness. During the day, you would, you would want this as bright as possible. However, at night, turning it down provides a more limited signal beam if you were trying to keep the message hidden from an enemy combatant. Semaphore is a close range, daytime only form of visual communication that uses arm position to represent letters. To accentuate the arm motions, flags are held. These flags are chosen to contrast with the background. The option or preparatory flags are standard, but the red and yellow option flags, shown here, are most common. Signalmen are often called skivvy wavers due to this form of communication. At its core, semaphore uses arm motions on an eight-point clock to represent letters. The rest position is when both flags are held down in front of the legs. It signifies a break between words. Words are formed by moving your arms from one letter to the next with a slight pause at the letter and then avoiding the rest position until the word is complete. Numbers are spelled out. Signal school required hours of classroom instruction and practice to become proficient. To assist the students with this task, various training aids were developed. One of them, this wheel, was designed to help the students recognize the different semaphore letters from the receiving and the sending perspective. It was also encouraged that students practice facing each other signaling the same messages so that they can make the connection between the message they are sending and what it would look like if they were to receive it. Okay, the semaphore alphabet is as follows. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Thank you for joining us today on this discussion of Naval Beach Battalion signaling methods. We hope you found it interesting and learned something new. Thank you so much, Chris. And I just want to tell everybody a little bit about Chris Egan. Uh, last year at D-Day Connie's 2019 event, 
Uh, Chris noticed that uh, the docks were coming in, um, uh, not one right after another, but coming in a little bit piecemeal. And we, of course we had to move a lot of men off those docks and get them into, uh, into the combat operations as quick as possible. And Chris noted to me, he says, well, why don't we combine our sections together, uh, the C and D areas, the landing areas. And I said, that's a great idea, Chris. You just earned an extra stripe. So I just want to congratulate Chris on being promoted from uh, Sigmund third class to Sigmund second class. Thank you so much, Chris. And that was a great idea to bring a lot of uh, uh, more men onto the beach safer uh, in 2019. So great job. And the fourth part of the Naval Beach Battalions is our medical section. And I think it's best described by our pharmacist mate, second class, Larry Smith of Westchester, Pennsylvania. Larry? Thank you for uh, handing off to the uh, medical division of the uh, Beach Battalion. I'm going to speak to you uh, for a few minutes here in regards to the uh, role that the Navy Medical Corps played with the Beach Battalions at the landing on D-Day on June 6th of 1944. Navy doctors and corpsmen brought ashore all the equipment that they thought they would need in order to be able to take care of the casualties and get them back to uh, the hospital ships that were offshore. What you see here is a very small part of a naval beach battalion uh, would have brought ashore, or at least attempted to bring ashore, on June 6th. Um, this case here, called a, a Unit 5 case, there were five of them that were issued to every uh, medical section of the beach battalion, and each case had a very specific set of equipment. This case here is set up as a 5B case, which means that it handled uh, first aid supplies, bandages, tourniquets, um, uh, some medications, instruments, uh, banded scissors, tweezers, things like that. Uh, other so here's a uh, close-up of the uh, aid station uh, first aid box. As you can see, all the different um, dressings and things that are that are in here for handling the various uh, wounds that we'll encounter in battlefield conditions. This uh, right here, I get a lot of questions about, that is a what we call a ladder splint. It's a moldable uh, for plating on fractures in the arm and leg. You can shape it into the shape of the fracture. And you can see, you know, tourniquets. Uh, here's a tourniquet right here for it you to see um, wound tablets. The wound tablets are a, uh, a drug called sulfalidomide, one of the first antibiotics predating um, uh, penicillin. Uh, you would give these to the troops uh, to prevent uh, infection. Uh, also another thing a lot of people have seen in the movie Saving Private Ryan is they sprinkle a white powder um, on the wound and this is uh, powdered sulfalidomide and every soldier uh, carries one of these in a small first aid pouch on their belt in addition to a first aid dressing and in here would be the uh, the sulfur, the white powder that gets sprinkled directly um, onto the wound. <clears throat> and you can see more sulfur, things like iodine, mercurochrome, um, there's um, lots of uh, morphine in here for pain control. Other cases carried surgical equipment ashore, carrying all the things that the surgeons would need to perform uh, life-saving intervention um, on our um, on the casualties that would arrive at the uh, aid stations on the beach. Uh, in addition, they had other cases that handled the plasma supplies. Uh, plasma was very important. Uh, in the saving of lives during um, the landings. Plasma didn't need to be refrigerated. It came in a, um, in a, a dry powdered form and had sterile water added to it in order to reconstitute it into something that could be used um, on the uh, casualties. It also carried uh, products for doing transfusions right there in, in the aid station. And eventually too, whole blood could be brought ashore uh, for the uh, medical people to uh, administer blood to the wounded uh, while they were ashore. Um, some other things that are carried in here, we talked about um, you know, medications. Uh, I want to try and show you here 
is uh, everybody ask about the morphine. Everybody's seen the movie Saving Private Ryan, and this is the famous morphine that you see them administering um, on the beaches and to the wounded soldiers. It's just a little tiny tube, looks like a small uh, toothpaste tube with a very large needle on it. The reason for the large needles, it's made to go through clothing and very large muscles, usually typically given in a thigh, uh, a much bigger, bigger muscle. And he carried a lot of this uh, in that case because morphine became a very, very important drug in um, calming down the uh, casualties. Some other thing, again, I show you the plasma. As, you, as I said, it comes in a freeze-dried form and we would add water to it to reconstitute it and it could be administered right in the field to the uh, wounded soldiers. <clears throat> Some other things are the um, surgical equipment that we have to, uh, for the surgeons to perform interventions to save lives. What did wind up happening on D-Day is as we know the history, the landings on Omaha Beach almost uh, were pushed right back into the water. And uh, a lot of the plans that were preset didn't work. And the Naval Beach Battalion's uh, medical department wound up taking care of a majority of the wounded soldiers uh, that couldn't be put back onto the hospital ships uh, until the next day. The, the Navy corpsmen and the, and the surgeons wound up uh, setting up aid stations in foxholes, digging it in the sand, and uh, holding on to the casualties through the night, administering morphine, administering plasma, and even the surgeons doing some interventions to try and save lives to keep the wounded American and Allied soldiers alive until uh, the next day. Uh, some other things that um, we have here, uh, Navy corpsmen were also trained in mortuary um, procedures. Uh, when you think about it, on board ship, uh, the Navy corpsmen, if there's not, there's not a surgeon on every ship, so Navy corpsmen become the medical person for a ship. So they have a pretty extensive training, and one of them is taking care of, of the casualties that don't make it. And in the Normandy landings, that was one of the things that the uh, Navy corpsmen did also, is, is handling um, the casualties and some things, you know, it's very important, um, you know, how our, our our deceased soldiers are taken care of in the military had very clearly defined um, protocols and procedures on how it was to be done. And of course, you know, everybody talks about dog tags and mine here are very typical of the Navy and the Marine Corps dog tags. They don't look like your typical uh, dog tags that everybody is used to. Uh, which is uh, this version right here with the notch. And, you know, there is a rumor about, or a myth about that notch. People said that the notch was in these dog tags that when you had a deceased soldier, that you would take the dog tag and it would lodge in the space in between the front teeth to keep the dog tag with the body. That's a myth. The, the notch on this dog tag is for the machine that does the stamping. It holds it in place so that they can stamp it without it sliding around. So, if you, you can see that this dog tag is blank, and we would have a bunch of blank dog tags so that we could make sure that if we can identify a body that doesn't have a dog tag for some reason, uh, we're going to emboss a dog tag, uh, actually two of them, and put one with the body, and one is going to be kept with the records. And this bag here is a casualty, a deceased casualties bag, which is where all, a lot of information is going to be lot recorded uh, in regards to the casualty, um, including their serial number, what you know, regiment they belong to, you know, where they're buried, uh, describing the body, you know, what type of uniform, things like that. And in addition to that, <clears throat> to to make sure that again, very important to get all of our soldiers identified. This is a. Uh, a burial identification kit and you see there's these green bottles here and uh, these green bottles were meant to have uh, a form that was filled out that went with the deceased and the gr it was placed inside the green bottle and the green bottle was stuck in the armpit of the deceased so hopefully that it would stay there um, and the paperwork going in the green bottle 
would mean that the green bottle would preserve the paperwork so when Gray's registration later would uh, re-enter the U.S. casualties, they'd be able to identify um, the bodies and also be able to notify the next of, next of kin. <clears throat> You know, our, our casualty here, how did they get to us? Well, uh, Jeeps were, were used as ambulances. Jeeps were, were much smaller and uh, agile and could be moved around the beaches very quickly and easily. And it was very common that Jeeps were converted into use as uh, ambulances. And of course, you'll say, well, you're Navy, but it looks like an Army Jeep. And, you know, because we're the Navy that's on the land, uh, a lot of our the uniforms, and even the color of our vehicles match what we're doing. Uh, we kind of blend in with the Army, but we do have our own distinct um, identification, including the fact that all of our uniforms are marked U.S. Navy uh, to, to signify that we are uh, not part of uh, the Army. And stations also not just took care of the, 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 the physical wounds of the troops, but they also had um, a way of taking care of the the, the psychological needs of the troops, including uh, there was a specific um, aid station care package that was set up that contained hot chocolate, tea, and coffee, along with some crackers and candy, um, so that you know when the soldiers were, were coming in that did not appear to have any obvious physical wounds, um, today we would call it PTSD, but during the war, uh, they thought that maybe if you made them some hot chocolate, tea, coffee, gave them some candy, crackers, um, they would s settle down and you'd be able to send those troops right back out um, into the combat again. So, as you can see, um, the uh, medical people had a very diverse job. Uh, you know, we not only took care of the, the wounds, we not only took care of uh, our, our deceased casualties, we also took care of the psychological needs of the troops also. The idea was that the medical people, we kind of gave them a, a boost in their morale that they knew that we were there to take care of them and uh, help them out. But with that, I'm going to uh, pass you back to Beach Battalion headquarters and they're going to talk to you a little bit more about some of the other aspects of the uh, Navy on shore. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. I appreciate that very much. I think it's very important information that people need to know about what the Navy did and the Navy corpsmen, pharmacists, mates, and hospital apprentices, that they, uh, their vital job on D-Day. Thanks, Larry. And the last lamp I want to talk about today is an M227 signal light. This particular light was used uh, also on the beaches by the uh, Navy Beach Battalions to have that first uh, means of communication from shore to ship. And so uh, with this being said, uh, I'm going to send my final message with this particular signal lamp to all our World War II veterans out there. And I know exactly what you're going to say when you see this. And thank you. For those of you who don't know, I just sent out the, the uh, Morse code uh, for the letter V. V for victory. Thank you gentlemen and thank you ladies for serving our great country in World War II and bringing us the liberty and freedom that we, we so desperately need in these times.